Hello, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Chaim Israel, Global Strategies and Head of Thematic Investing in Bank of America Global Securities. I'm so pleased and honored today to be joined by Jack Hilary, the co-founder and CEO of Sandbox, uh, one of the global leaders of AI quantum computing that we're going to speak about today, about the revolution, generative AI. Unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last year or so, this has taken over the world by a storm. And I cannot think about a better person to talk to about the revolution, why the world is going to change with Jack. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jack. We've been all talking about generative AI. We've been discussing the technology. The, you know, the amount of data and discussions around it have really exploded. And I, run, I want to use you to talk about, okay, what's next? How companies should address this technology? What could be the key thing that companies should start looking at? How you vision two, three years down the road, how companies are really implementing technology, where the value can come from, and then we'll take it to other directions. Thanks, Chaim. It's great to be with you here today. We're going to share some thoughts now with a global audience. Let me get to your first question on generative AI. Where did it come from? Why is it so impactful? Then we can get to other technologies that will come in that complement generative AI and are equally as important that investors think about. So when it comes to generative AI, of course, the confluence and convergence of multiple factors, huge data sets uh, available online, downloaded, and of course, the GPUs. Uh, there's lots of companies now making these GPUs. NVIDIA, of course, foremost among them. Uh, recently, we had an article about how we're using a number of these NVIDIA GPUs in novel ways. We'll get to that in a little bit with simulation. But NVIDIA is certainly leading the charge. But Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft, all in the game now, making and designing these new kinds of specialized chips, these GPUs. It's the second kind of use of GPUs. GPUs, of course, the G for graphics, initially used to make video games much better. So anyone listening to us right now, Chaim, if they see a teenager playing video games, they should thank them because <laughs> because of those video games that we have the GPUs in the first place. But those of us in AI for many years realized that the GPUs, that same mathematics that it knows how to do well, taking a large matrix of numbers. You can think about it like a spreadsheet of numbers multiplied by another spreadsheet. We call that matrix multiplication. That's what GPUs do really well. It turns out we can do neural network math in that same way. So GPUs ended up having this whole new life, new demand. It's driven up NVIDIA now to a, a trillion dollar market cap and other chip companies also now looking at this space. So very interesting trends that I, I commend that the listeners and viewers to our webinar today, Chaim, look not just at the software side, a lot of emphasis has been placed on that. And of course, very interesting players there. But people should really focus on the milestones about to hit in the next six to nine months on the hardware side as well, in terms of the individual GPUs that are getting faster and faster, but also how we network the GPUs into these pods of GPUs, uh, 2,048 GPUs, 4,096 GPUs. And we're going to see some real innovation, time in the next few years, 24 months, 36 months, in terms of the interconnect. We call it the interconnect. How do you actually get them so close to each other, talking so well to each other, each GPU in a big data center, that it's like one virtual GPU? Google has a solution for that. Amazon has one, NVIDIA itself has a different solution than both those companies. So there's going to be a lot of com competition to kind of bring these GPUs together in one kind of hive mind that allows you to run even AI even faster and even have more of an advantage. So taking it back now to the publicly listed companies and the impact on, on these companies, of course, we know generative AI is very good at content creation. And so we think about customer service, when we think about generating the ability for uh, consumers to get large amounts of information, but narrowing it down to the information they need at the moment, uh, I think we all can agree we can have a much better customer experience than dialing up customer service on a phone, punching numbers one after the other, getting the wrong answer all the time, being on hold. That's a bad experience. And so we, we have to evolve the customer experience for all the companies that are customer facing, be it an airline, 
uh, be it, you know, a any other, you know, cable companies, telephony companies, anyone with large numbers, millions of customers, we're going to see a massive evolution there. Content generation. Banks, for example, uh, Bank of America generates a huge amount of analyst content. And it doesn't replace the analyst, of course, but it generates a certain amount of content that the analyst can then use and shape with a particular point of view of themselves as an analyst. It raises the analyst up to a higher value level rather than just putting the usual basic pieces together after every quarterly earnings call. A lot of that is formulaic. The AI can do that. The analysts can then come in with a very specific point of view. So financial services, content generation for the media companies. We all know that media companies have huge labor costs. If you look at a Pixar film, you might think, wow, it's made on computers. It should cost less than a big budget uh, production with sets. Turns out it costs more. Uh, the average Pixar film like Toy Story costs two to $300 million. Uh, not very cheap. Now, though, we're going to see a big disruption for the media companies because now it's possible to do text to video. We're starting to see the early parts of that, creating two, three minute videos completely from AI, the music, the dialogue, the interaction, all that storyline from the AI. This will move very quickly and will disrupt the media industry very, very dramatically. We just saw the wrapping up of the worker of the writer strike. Uh, in Hollywood. And one of the key tenets of that right of strike was around this AI issue. So we'll look to that as well. But then we also now have to look at industries that go beyond just content generation, Chaim. And, and this is where aerospace, automotive, batteries, clean tech, energy, these are areas that take us beyond the current generative AI tool. So I think we can talk about that next. Well, so no... That's fascinating so much. Thank you so much, Jack. And it really goes down to, I could not agree with you more. One of the key problems, I would probably say mistakes that investors are making when they are talking about generative AI, and I think you made a great point about it, that they continue to focus about generative AI and the technology sector. And to some extent, that's a mistake. Any industry, any industry can start using generative AI. Um, if you are in, in our research, we have said, you know, if you are data heavy, if you are text heavy, if you are a consumer heavy, if you are employment heavy, you can start using it, which if you think about it, applies to almost everything. And before we go to our next topic, I just want to you know, we, we are big believers and written about that, that in the coming years, there will be two kinds of companies, companies that will use generative AI and companies that will just not exist. Do you agree with that? I would even be stronger than that. I would say that there are going to be companies that use the frontier technologies. It includes generative AI, but I would also add a few other technologies that are not currently being talked about. And so I think we can help the audience today by adding a few other elements. An example, let's say you're a company such as a pharma company, biotech, biopharma. The job there is to make great medicines, to solve big diseases, and to do that as soon as possible and as safely as possible. Unfortunately, what we've seen, Chaim, in that industry, it's not Moore's law, it's Eroom's law. Moore's law backwards. Eroom's law says things are getting slower and more expensive. And that's unfortunately what's happening in the pharma sector. Consumers are outraged. Why are these pharmaceutical medicines costing so much? Well, they cost so much, unfortunately, because there's only about 10% success of any drug candidate coming into clinical trials, 90% failure, 10% success. You know, that means that the 10% success has to pay for the 90% of failure. And so that's why we're seeing Keytruda, a great drug that helps with lots of cancers, $100,000 for one person for a year. That's expensive. We're seeing other drugs hit half a million dollars a year. That's CAR-T and other kinds of technologies for other kinds of cancers. We're seeing some drugs, some genetic drugs, at a million dollars per dose. But again, those success stories are having to pay for the huge amount of failure. So what do we do about industries such as biotech and biopharma, these hit-based industries where most of it's failure and a small amount of success, and that success only comes after an average of 13 years of work and usually two and a half to four billion dollars of spend. That's a lot of risk, right? That companies are taking 
So for example, in the biopharma sector. Well, can generative AI help? I mean, a little bit, because of course, it could read the literature, it could look at some ideas, but ultimately you're talking about molecules here. You're talking about a molecule that could be a great drug candidate for brain cancer, for pancreatic cancer, two cancers that we still don't have any really good medicine for. We could talk about Alzheimer's, 40 years of research, nothing to show for it. So when it comes to a drug candidate, this is not a great application of generative AI, Chaim, because there is no data to look at. If we had the data, we would have solved it by now. So this is a case where there's novel types of issues. And in this case, this is where another tool is now coming to the fore, a tool called simulation. A simulation uses the same GPUs that we just talked about from NVIDIA, from other companies. So the same kind of mathematical operations in terms of matrix times matrix, but now instead of doing it for neural networks, for mimicking a brain, what we're doing here is actually using them for the fundamental mathematical and quantum equations of how one molecule will fit with another molecule. So different set of equations, different kind of focus. And in this case, instead of using big data sets and training an AI on it, what we're doing in this case of simulation is a bottom-up build, new data. We call it synthetic data or novel data, data that's being created from the bottom up by math equations themselves. This is a complementary tool. It's not being talked about yet in all the different uh, trade publications and online, but I think in the next 36 months, we're going to start hearing more and more about simulation as a complementary tool to generative AI. Because now once you have this new data set, then you can apply AI, of course, to that, and you can optimize for a goal. Let's say the biopharma wants to make it uh, a, a drug that works right away or a drug that is time-released. So you can use AI to manage all those parameters to optimize that particular molecular structure. But this tool of simulation also now brings us into the area of energy and clean tech. Same question you asked before. There are going to be two kinds of companies, companies that use these tools and companies that don't exist at all. When it comes, for example, to batteries, we all know that batteries, again, do not follow Moore's law. We only see about a 4% increase in battery uh, capacity per year, uh, energy density, power density, any metric you want to use, haven't seen a big breakthrough there. And when we look at all the possible ways of creating a battery, there are many of them that don't use lithium at all. Those are promising because we know about the supply chain issues of lithium. So again, looking at simulation as a complement to AI, this is where we can build up a bottoms up new data set Ion by ion, essentially looking at how to create these new battery chemistries. So I think, Heim, to answer your question, we're going to see now a toolbox of very, very compelling and powerful tools that will help companies leap forward. Biopharma companies, chemical companies, battery chemistry, solar energy, aerospace and automotive. We can talk about those sectors. They have a job of making ca cars lighter weight, but still very strong. That's a material science issue, of course. That means new kinds of alloys. And so, again, we need both AI and simulation, two tools combined to drive these kinds of things forward. So when people think about these management teams and these companies, again, to your point, I think most folks talking about AI have made the mistake of talking about only in the tech sector. We now, I think, need to bring this conversation very squarely into the core traditional sectors of our economy. Interesting, and you talked about the toolbox. That's a fascinating point because most people are just focusing on generative AI. You know, I have data sets, that's what's coming out and they don't get the, the fact that in many industries and many of our process, we just don't have the data and this is where the real value comes. Can you explain a little bit about the toolbox? So you spoke about simulation, can you talk about what's what are we else were missing? Yeah, sure. So the toolbox, I think, will have several compelling frontier technologies in it. And again, it's the because we're getting more and more computing power, both because the underlying chips, the way we're connecting the chips, and also what we call co-design. This is a term that I think investors should got, start getting familiar with, Chaim. The idea of co-design says that people who make software and algorithms could work with people who make the hardware and the chips, and they could co-design together. And that's what's happening 
starting right now. More and more is now interface and conversation happening between these two different parts of the tech industry to try to make chips and firmware. Firmware is that software that sits right on the chip and the algos and application level software to work together in a harmonized future. And this is going to unleash compelling results for all the industries we just discussed. So one tool in the toolbox is generative AI. Second tool is simulation, bottoms up building new data, right? From using math equations of the actual physics of what's happening in aerospace, automotive, medicine, biopharma, energy, all these different very important spaces. In fact, the biggest TAM of all is the physical world, right? As much as we love the world of bits, the world of atoms is much bigger. It's the world we live in. We are not made, unfortunately, of bits. So as much as we love bits, if you want to fix the human body, if you want to hit, hit disease, if you want to do fitness, all that is the world of atoms as well. Another tool in the toolbox will, is knowledge graphs. And so knowledge graphs have been around for a while. They're getting more and more powerful. No one's been talking about them. But here's one of the great things about knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs, you can say... Why don't you ingest all the biomedical literature? We want you to create a, a graph with nodes where each node represents a molecule that could be a good drug. And why don't you bunch nodes together that are similar in structure? That's what a knowledge graph is about. And then attached to that is the peer-reviewed literature about what's known about those kinds of drugs. What are the upsides of that drug? What are the toxicities of that drug? Here's the great thing about knowledge graphs, Chaim. They don't hallucinate, right? They're not models just based on pure statistics. Generative AI, very powerful, but unfortunately we know all too well that it hallucinates a good chunk of the time. It's making stuff up. And uh, we know that that poor lawyer who used it to generate a case in front of the judge <laughs> found out the hard way that it's hallucinating. The same thing, of course, when it comes to medicine. If we want a companion, a diagnostic companion for a doctor, I call it like the bird on the shoulder, right? Parrot on the shoulder, where it doesn't replace a doctor. It helps a doctor to look at all the data. Well, in that case, we cannot tolerate hallucinations. We can't have a hallucinatory AI helping the doctor and making things up. Knowledge graphs, though, are very powerful tools to help with diagnostics and also looking at other kinds of decisions. And they do not hallucinate because they are not probabilistic statistical models, they are in fact graph models, very, very complementary tool. So I think it's time now to, yes, it's great that we have a lot of attention on generative AI, but let's build on this attention now. Let's take advantage of this now and say to the management teams of the public listed companies, it's time to look at a broader set of tools in the toolbox as well. It's amazing because we've been, as you said, and you outlined so smartly we are just at the first chapter thank you so much for your time and i can't wait for the next chapter thanks i'm